Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another session in the AIA California Monterey Design Conference University Series. My name is Hillary Kreck, and I am the Director of Programs for AIA California, and I will be your moderator for today's segment. This afternoon's presentation is brought to you by Client Pay, a legacy partner of the 2021 Monterey Design Conference. It's not too late to join us for our first MDC on the road coming to you live wherever you are. This virtual format is our way of inviting you to see what makes the Monterey Design Conference the architect retreat and why we have so many loyal attendees. Our headliner speakers this year will join us from Portugal, Japan, England, Boston, and of course, right here in California. Clear your calendar next Thursday and Friday, October 21st and 22nd and carve out time to focus on these amazing architects and how their work is shaping the world. More details on our lineup of speakers and registration are available online at montereydesignconference.org. A few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started with today's presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenters. You can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. The session is being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website shortly after today's presentation. Um, now on to today's session. Getting paid doesn't have to be a pain. Consider this webinar an introduction into all things online payments from credit cards to e-checks to wire transfers. We will discuss strategies to stay on top of your receivables and create a more efficient office. This session will cover tips, tools, and resources that you can start implementing immediately in your office to get more money in your firm's pocket. And I would like to quickly in introduce Jordan. Jordan Turk is a practicing attorney in Texas and is also the law practice advisor at LawPay. She earned a BA in Classics, History and Religious Studies from the University of Texas and went on to earn her law degree from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Prior to law pay, Jordan worked with a high asset family law firm in Houston, Texas. So with that, take it away, Jordan. Beautiful, thank you so, so much, Hillary. And let me see screen sharing, we're doing it. <laughs> all right, thank y'all so much for having me and welcome to Don't Leave Bunny on the Table, the mechanics of cashless payments and how to increase your collections. So a little bit more about me and why you think, oh, how can Jordan relate to us? So I am a practicing family law attorney, all the drama, all the time. It's really great <laughs> uh, here in Texas. But part of it is I had to learn from a very, uh, when I was a very young baby attorney, I had to learn about receivables and how my pay and my bonuses were tied to receivables. So you can imagine that I got very adept, I would say, at bill collecting, essentially. And what's kind of funny about law school or really any other kind of professional industry like you and I have with architecture and things like that is, you know, you go to school and you think you have these grand ideas of what you're going to be. You know, I'm going to be up here arguing cases. I'm going to be in front of the Supreme Court. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. But nobody actually tells you when you go to school that actually you're going to need to be a salesman and a bill collector sometimes. So super fun with that. But part of this presentation and what we're kind of, oh, I'll go back. But part of what we're doing here and the aim here is to give you tangible, effective tools that you can go and take back to your firms tomorrow to really supercharge your collections and hopefully get you on good financial footing and also give you an idea of how cashless payments work. So I'm talking wire transfers, credit cards. We'll talk a little bit about crypto, you know, everyone's favorite uh, next thing on the horizon and can you be paid with it and things like that. So we'll go over everything. And again, if you have questions, we'll get to them at the very end. Happy to answer anything and everything that you might need. So just let me know. Right, and a little bit more about client pay. And so we are a, an online payment solution. So essentially if somebody comes into your office and wants to pay you $5,000, which isn't that the dream, and they wanna do it via credit card or ACH transaction, things like that, we help facilitate that process. And a big thing about client pay is that your clients don't need a separate login to pay you. They can just pay you from your webpage or pay you from a link on your email and things like that. And then also too, we have live people here to help you. So if you call our support line, somebody's going to answer within two rings and it's going to be somebody here in Austin, Texas. Also, hello from Texas. Uh, we have a tropical storm coming in, so hopefully that doesn't do anything with the connection for today's presentation. Pray for me. 
All right, so a little bit about what we're going to talk about. So we've already cleared the introduction. Look at that, we're already done with that. So two types of cashless payments and how they work. So again, wire transfers, credit cards, ACHs, how do they actually work on the back end? Because that was the whole thing, especially as an attorney, uh, people would come to me and, you know, vendors would come to me and say, well, you need X, Y, Z. And they would explain to me how the product worked, but they wouldn't explain to me kind of the mechanics of it all. So I'm always interested in why does this work this way and why am I being charged X, Y, Z? So I'll go through that with you. So it'll hopefully kind of demystify all of that for you. And then we'll talk about processing fees and surcharging. So you might have a you might have a question of, can I actually pass these credit card fees onto the client, things like that? We'll go through it. Uh, how to accept cashless payments in the first place for your firm. Uh, what to do when a client contests the payment. This is super, super mega, mega important because uh, there are certain things that you can do to make it easier for you to defend these payments and make it so that basically your chargeback rate and things like that is probably going to be the lowest of low of low. So I'll take you through that too. And then next would be improving your processes, billing and collections. So again, this is kind of my bread and butter uh, because I kind of revamped our firm's policies when it came to collecting on invoices and things like that to make it most effective. So I'll take you through some tips and tricks with that, kind of the psychology behind payments, when should you be sending out invoices and things like that, what's going to be the best day to send it out, and we'll go through that and hopefully get you paid and get you paid sooner. So types of cashless payments and how they actually work. So one I'm sure everyone here is familiar with is the almighty wire transfer. So typically that's a bank to bank transfer or a non-bank transfer. So if you use like MoneyGram or Western Union, that's how that works. And here's the deal with my firm, especially cash was always king and wire transfers were always king because, hey, I could get, I would never ask questions about if somebody were to drop off $10,000 in cash. Uh, at my firm, but I would take it no problem and go deposit it that day. I'd have zero issues with it. And we'll talk about it a little bit more about how that's kind of going by the wayside uh, as we move forward, especially through the pandemic and beyond, and about what people actually want from their vendors and what people actually want from their service providers like lawyers or architects. So we'll go through it too. And then ACH transactions. So that's a bank to bank transfer, except, and we'll talk about it, Payments are made through the ACH network. So it's kind of like a wire transfer where it's bank to bank, except that there's kind of this in-between that it has to go through. Uh, cryptocurrency, I'll hit on that <laughs> because a lot of people have questions about it. It's a little bit tricky uh, accounting wise. There are ways to do it and there are services to do it, but it's a little crazy right now. I do think it's gonna get better in the future, but we'll go through it and I'll talk to you about it. Uh, and then of course, credit card transactions. So that we'll talk about on the next slide. It's a multi-stage process. So a lot of people are like, why does it take up to two days to get this money in my account when I, you know, when a client wants to pay me via credit card, which is still obviously quicker than say a check. Uh, here, because here was my issue, I would say my firm and my practice personally, and again, I worked in high asset family law uh, down in Houston, Texas. So typically a client would come in and they'd want to pay me either in check because that's just what they brought with them for their retainer. So if my retainer was $10,000, they would bring in a check and they'd write me a check right then and there at our initial client consultation. And that's how they'd pay me. Or great majority of the time, I would say 70% of the time, they'd want to put it on their credit card. And I would take the credit card all day long because the problem with checks is, okay, they write it. You have to go and deposit it. You have to hope and pray that it clears and that it doesn't bounce and then wait for that to clear in your account and then look it up and find it and see and verify that, and that the funds are there. So all of a sudden that could take up to a week just to make sure and verify that those funds are in your account. So credit cards, I liked a little bit more because a lot of times, especially with attorneys, and I'm sure y'all have clients like this too, it just depends, but they want to pay you. And that means when they pay you, they want work to begin immediately. And my thing is I always wanna be billing against funds. I wanna be billing against cash in my account. And so if I have to wait a week for funds to clear or I start working on a case and hope and pray that the check doesn't bounce, I'm kind of doing myself a disservice in the event that it does bounce and all of a sudden I've already done $3,000 worth of work on that case only to find out that, hey, after the fact, the check didn't clear. So that's kind of my big thing is I want to reduce friction as much as possible between my client's pocketbook and my firm's trust or operating account. So that was my paramount uh, paramount concern, I would say, is I just want to increase efficiency in my firm 
and I want to make sure that they can pay me whatever way they'd like to pay me. And again, I love cash, I love wire transfers, but a great majority of the time, the clients wanted to pay me via credit card. So how does it work? So credit cards, first step, the client comes into your firm, pays you with a credit card. Well, we've all done this. You've been that client before to a service provider. Second, the firm then sends the credit card details to the acquiring bank. So that's the second step. Third step is the acquiring bank forwards the credit card details to the credit card network. So, you know, like ACHs have a network, credit cards also have their own little network here. And then four, the credit card network request payment authorization from the issuing bank. And then it all kind of gets filtered through and that's how that money gets deposited. But that's why this can't be done instantaneously is because there are so many steps that it takes for a credit card to kind of clear on the back end and get those funds deposited. And a little bit, I hit on this before, but especially this is not going away. So as far as, hey, do people actually want this and do people actually want to pay by credit card? So there was a study done in 2018, so it's a little aged at this point, where they found that 79% of people now prefer to pay with a credit or debit card. So if we're looking at that through the lens of the pandemic in 2021, that number is probably more like 90 to 95% at this point. For instance, my entire practice right now is remote. So I'm not taking any physical cash. I'm not taking any physical checks. So I'm solely doing ACH transactions and checks. And then if they want to wire transfers, but for some reason, nobody ever wants to wire money to their divorce attorney. It's so strange. Nobody ever wants to pay their divorce attorney either, which is also strange. Odd, but I'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then 74% of households uh, report that they pay bills online, which again, nothing crazy because chances are you pay a bill online. 79% of consumers said that they've switched to paperless billing as opposed to getting it physically in the mail. And 70% say that having multiple ways to pay their bill increases their satisfaction. So again, if I'm a salesman and I want this client to be happy with me, I already know that they're going to be happy with my work product. And you already know that they're going to be happy with yours. So the next step is I want them not only to be happy with my work product because I know I'm good when I get into a courtroom. You know you're good when you send them your designs. So the next step is how am I going to make them happy with the whole kind of administrative process, right? It's a full package. It's not just what I can do in the courtroom. It's how are they recognized in my firm? How are they treated as I go along with their case and with their matter? So this is just one of those very simple, easy things where they can ask like, oh, can I pay by credit card? And it's not a, oh, I'm sorry, I only take cash or check. Like, really sorry about that. You're going to have to find a way to work that out. So instead of say, absolutely, because name of the game, especially for me, is I will take payment in any way, shape, or form that I can get it. Just pay me. All right, so processing fees and surcharging. So this is a fun little thing. So a lot of people like, hey, you know, this processor wants to charge me 3.5% or 4% to run this credit card. I think that's crazy. Like, what actually goes into these rates? So there are three things that make up these credit card processing rates, which I always found fascinating. A little bit of background about me too, is that I used to work for Walmart corporate in their treasury department. So I got to deal with this kind of on a global scale, which was really, really cool and a little bit frightening. But anyway, so talking about what goes into making up your processing fees for your credit cards. So one is your dues and assessments. So those are minimal. Two, your merchant processor fees, i.e. your client pay fees. And then the bulk of that Ugh, sorry, I can't talk. The bulk of that processing fee comes from your interchange rate or your interchange fee. Now, what is that exactly? Your interchange fee is what the credit cards dictate it to be. So the credit card brands get together. So that's Visa, Amex, Discover, and they get together and they say, hey, we need XYZ to actually run these cards and actually, you know, make a profit and prevent fraud. So there are, there's about 300 little fees that go into this interchange rate. Because for instance, you know, when your credit card is compromised and somebody spends $1,000 on it, you're actually not liable for that. But that person already has the money or has that product and that company gets that money, the bank's not gonna yank it away. So the bank has to make up for that fraud. So that's part of why you have these fees. It's to protect against fraud, prevent fraud, and then also it has to kind of uh, help you <laughs> essentially or help the credit card companies recoup uh, what is lost when they have to cover those fees for you. So that's essentially what happens there with your interchange fees. Now, the thing to watch out for is you can't generally at all ever dip below that base interchange rate that is set by the card brands. So when you're shopping around for processors, make sure to ask about what their processing fees are and not just think, 
oh, well, they told me that it's going to be 1% only, and that's fine. I'm just going to sign up with that. Because here's the deal. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. So if somebody is saying that they will process all of your cards for 1%, that's impossible because they're dipping below that base interchange rate. So they cannot do that. So what they're doing at that point is they're kind of baiting and switching you. So they're bringing you in with a promise of here's only 1% uh, that will charge you for your credit card rate. And then the company, the processor at that point is making up that difference because they just want you in the door and they want you to sign a contract and here it is. So they bring you in at 1% and then three months later, boom, they start charging you 5% because they have to recoup basically what they've lost at that point because they were paying for what was above that 1% that they were charging. So hopefully that makes sense, but understand that again, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. So when you're shopping around, ask for rates, ask for how often they do increases. So really basic things like that for your credit card rates and just understand that there can be some seedy things out there and just to be careful of it. All right, and then other factors that affect interchange rates. So remember, this is what's set by the card brands. Also, I should say, does it sound a little sketch and a little weird that credit card brands are the ones setting their own interchange rates? Uh, you know, who polices the police kind of a deal. Yes, it does. Have there been lawsuits uh, about this? Yes. Have there been global lawsuits about the credit card brand setting these interchange fees? Yes. And actually, there was one that came down a couple of years ago, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, but that is what uh, this lawsuit came down. They basically said that it was an antitrust lawsuit uh, between all these credit card brands who were setting these interchange fees. And essentially what was born out of that lawsuit, which the credit card brands lost essentially, is that you can now surcharge. So it used to be before that lawsuit, surcharging was outlawed in pretty much every single state, but now that has changed and it's pretty much a trickle down effect from this antitrust lawsuit. All right, so going back to just talking about interchange in general. So we have a, there are three factors that can kind of, uh, what, I'm, what am I trying to say, that can affect it uh, when it comes to how much you pay. So for instance, card type. A debit card is going to be a lower interchange fee than a credit card because it's different, that's connected directly to your checking account. So they're going to consider that less risk for the credit card company. It's more risk for you because remember, if you get your debit card compromised and somebody spends $1,000 out of your checking account, generally you can't recover that money. So that means the credit card companies don't care about it because they don't have to cover that fraud. So that's why it's going to be a lower interchange fee for that particular card. And then the merchant type also affects interchange. So for instance, Walmart is going to have a vastly different uh, interchange rate than just a mom and pop shop here in Austin, for instance. And then sometimes the information that you provide is going to lower or is going to hopefully lower your interchange fee depending. So if you notice some websites that you go on, ask for uh, you know, very minimal information like your credit card number and then maybe your zip code of the billing address. Whereas other websites want your credit card number, the full billing address, the name of your firstborn son, things like that. And the theory behind it is, or I guess the facts behind it is, or fact behind it um, is, that the more information you provide, that means that it's going to be the lower interchange fee that, it, that, it, that they can charge. Because essentially they're saying, if you provide us more information, this means that it's less likely to be fraudulent so that's going to be a lower interchange fee. So that's why sometimes you see some websites just don't care enough. They just want your business and it's fine. And then some will ask for far more information when you're buying things. Okay, surcharging. So what is it? So the, it's the practice where you charge an additional percentage fee to a credit card transaction in order to offset those processing costs. So for instance, if, if your credit card processor says it's gonna be 4% to process its transaction, you can pass that 4% on to the client. So a lot of people, especially attorneys, because I know this is not going to shock anybody on this call, but a lot of us are very reticent to change and very stuck in the mud, especially when it comes to payments. So it's like a new thing and we're just like, oh, you know, we'll give it 10 years and then we'll see and then maybe we'll adopt it. But I will, set, I will tell you that at this point, surcharging, again, because of that lawsuit that I just mentioned prior, it's allowed in 48 US states, currently outlawed in Connecticut and Massachusetts, but I would say within the next year, that's going to change. Essentially lobbyists are going from state to state, filing lawsuits and overturning the prior uh, ban on surcharging essentially in every state. So you can do it, make sure to check with like your local governing board, but essentially this is allowable in California. So the only thing that you really need to know is 
major credit card companies still require that you follow specific procedures. One of those being you cannot surcharge a debit card because again, that's a it goes through kind of a different process, remember, and it's connected to your checking account rather than having to go through the credit card companies. So you can't surcharge a debit card. Two, you have to make it very explicit to the client that you're doing it. So for instance, having them sign something that says that this is a 4% surcharge, you acknowledge that you're paying it, things like that. So you just have to make it very clear to the client of what that is. And then three, you can't surcharge the client for more than your processing fee. So if your processing fee is 3% for a credit card, so let's say your processor wants to take 3% out of that transaction for the credit card, you can't go and charge your client 4% because that means that you're profiting off of that surcharge and that is not the intent of surcharging. So just be cognizant of that, be mindful of it. It's absolutely allowable now. And I know a lot of people, they're just like, oh, but it's weird and it's new, it's allowed. Uh, and I know that a lot of attorneys, again, uh, were really kind of you know, cringing about it and like, oh, should I do it? But I think the ones that have implemented it have liked it and it works for them. That being said, my personal opinion on it is to don't do it. And what I mean by that is if I, you know, again, because I'm a salesman, again, at the end of the day, salesman with a law degree, but for instance, if I was going to go online and I'm going to buy a $400 pair of shoes, and so I'm doing it, I'm committed to it. I don't want to spend $400, but I love these shoes and I'm going to get them. And then I get to the checkout online and then it says that it wants to charge me $7 for shipping. I will not buy those shoes if they are trying to charge me for shipping, because at this point, I think they're trying to nickel and dime me. Like I'm about to pay them $400. And now they're trying to say, oh no, 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 it's actually gonna be $7 more than that. So to me, I just get personally offended. And I guess maybe that's a me problem that I need to talk to a therapist about, but you know, we're not here for that. But essentially I just won't buy those shoes. And I kind of feel the same way about my clients where they're about to pay me sometimes upwards of $40,000 and they're paying it on their Amex and things like that. And so then what I don't wanna do at that point is say, hey, thank you for paying me $40,000. Also, we're gonna be charging you three to 4% on top of that at the end of the day. Because I think at that point, it starts off on a, it starts us on a, off on a bad relationship when it comes to the client and myself and the client and the firm because now they're wary about it and they're going to wonder, okay, well, they're already nickeling and diming me when it comes to just this initial retainer payment. What are they gonna do further on down the line? Also, I'm about to pay a lot of money to this firm and this is kind of how I'm being treated. So just because you can do it doesn't always mean that you should. That being said, if it works for you and if it works for your firm and your type of clientele are perfectly fine with paying that processing fee because it's just what they wanna do and they trust you, then do what works best for you and get your money at the end of the day. But for me and personally with my firm and most of the firms that I know, they generally don't surcharge. All right, so now how to accept cashless payments. So everybody kind of knows this uh, for the wire transfer, again, typically bank to bank. Uh, and, uh, and essentially you'll need specific information about that. So we essentially, no, what am I trying to say? We kept a PDF on the firm drive that essentially had all of our relevant information. So here's the firm's bank account, routing number, uh, address, things like that, so that we could just easily send it to the client if they asked. Uh, also, pro tip, if you have that, if <laughs> you have that practice in your office of accepting wire transfers, uh, be very careful that it's a non-editable uh, Word document or PDF, because the amount of uh, times that we had attorneys or staff save over our wiring instructions uh, was not good and a little bit horrifying. So just make sure it's a read-only document if you do that. And then for ACA's transactions, typically, for instance, if they're going through client pay, all the client has to do is just input their routing information, their bank information. So there's nothing that you, the firm, would have to do or give. And then the credit card transactions, typically, again, client puts, the, puts that in online and they pay you that way, or they're coming into your office and you're swiping the card or, or typing the information in. So here's a fun one. What to do when a client contests a payment? So for wire transfers, and you might already know this, but you know I've been in a little bit of a sticky thicket when it comes to wire transfers, not that I'm bitter about it at all, but essentially they're not good for the sender of the wire transfer if there is a contested one. So for instance, they're normally completely final. So once you wire the money to someone, 
just blah, blah, say goodbye to that money. It's no longer yours and chances are you're never going to see it again. So be very careful when wiring it. So triple check, make sure you have it in writing, where that money is going, things like that. It might be reversible. I say might uh, if the recipient of the wire transfer received more money than they were supposed to. So maybe just maybe. But in general, you're not getting that money back. And a little uh, quick story of, about that whole thing is at one point we had a case uh, that was ongoing. It was terrible. Husband actually oh lived out in California and had a very nice house that he was renovating. And the court here in Texas told him to stop renovating because he was spending an ungodly amount of money <laughs> at that point uh, in comparison to like what the estate looked like. But he was spending a lot of money on these uh, on a fixer upper house uh, down in Southern California. And what he ended up doing was there was one account that had liquid cash in it and there was about 250 grand in it. He decided one day to take that money from there and wire transfer it to a developer out in Southern California and to the builder, I should say. So he does that. Our client is notified immediately. So we get notified immediately. We're on the phone with the bank within probably three minutes of that happening. And the bank essentially told us, tough luck. They've already accepted the money. The, the uh, builder's bank already did. There's no way that we can recall it. So just be very careful <laughs> about uh, trying to get back wire transfers, triple check uh, everything about it. And yeah, we uh, learned our lesson on that one. Not that there was anything that we could have done, but it just really goes to show kind of how powerful wire transfers can be. But if you're the one that's sending it, you just need to be overly paranoid and cautious about it. All right, so disputed credit card transactions, something that everybody always has questions about. So when a credit card transaction is disputed, it's called a chargeback. And what is a chargeback? What is this, how does this actually work? You know, how does this look in practice? So a chargeback, very simply, essentially, is a client coming back after the fact. So say I charge them a $5,000 retainer. I've worked their case. It's a happy conclusion, as happy as, you know, child custody can be. <laughs> and, uh, and now after the fact, they're saying, mm, you know what, I never agreed uh, to actually have Jordan charge that. So they'll call their bank and they'll institute what's called a chargeback. And they typically have six months from the conclusion of services being rendered to contest this charge. In some cases, like with Amex, they actually give people about two years to contest it, although it's pretty rare, you know, at that point that they do it uh, that long, you know, as far as like waiting a year to contest it. But essentially, usually they have six months. And what happens at that point is the bank will go in and freeze that money. So if the client is disputing $5,000 in my firm's uh, operating account or in their trust account, the bank comes in, freezes that $5,000, and then basically says, okay, now we have to decide whose money this actually is. So once they're in dispute and they're frozen, the bank notifies you electronically and they'll notify, and client pay also gets notified. So we help you out there too. And then usually you get about seven to 10 days to respond. And then you're asking, well, what does a response look like? Well, a bank wants to see that that payment was authorized. So for instance, if when that client says, no, I didn't agree to pay Jordan $5,000, I'm sending them my fee agreement or the client signed it and said that, yes, <laughs> he agrees to pay me $5,000. And then I'm also sending our invoices to where I say, look, I've earned it. Here it was, it was billed to the client. It was properly you know, carried out essentially. And that's basically what the, <laughs> My, my dog, sorry. And that's basically what the banks want to see. They just want to see that it was authorized by that client and that you're not some type of fraudster. So the key here is to keep very, very good records and also use your payment processor to your advantage. So for instance, at Client Pay, we have a whole chargeback department. Not that we really need it, but we're really passionate about it. I think we have like an 85% success rate, which is about three times the, the average uh, when it comes to processors. So when you're shopping around, for credit card processors or ACH processors, online payment uh, solutions, this is going to be a big thing because everybody can kind of give you similar rates, but not everybody is going to have chargeback protection. So ask them about it, ask them what their uh, percentages are as far as how much they win and ask them if they have a dedicated department or people that are dedicated to help you with chargebacks. That being said, they were few and far between for me. I, you know, in five years of practice, I think I had three chargebacks. I won all of them because I kept good records and I kept my fee agreement, you know, and everything like that. So just be careful with it. Keep good records. But honestly, if you keep good records, you're going to win these cases. So because it's not like y'all are going out there willy nilly and just charging client credit cards for work that you haven't done. So 
that's really the key is just good records, use a good processor and just be cognizant that this is an option that clients have after the fact that they're paying online. But at the end of the day, you're going to win this. And it's not as frequent as you would ever think. All right, so now let's talk about improving your processes, billing and collections. So again, this is kind of my bread and butter, as I mentioned before. So big, big thing is just rip off the Band-Aid. And what do I mean by that? So no one wants to contact clients about payments, but you do not work for free. I equate it this way, as in if I'm going to pick up my car from a mechanic, I'm not going to pick up my car, drive off with it and say, hey, mechanic, I think I'm going to think I'm going to just, you know, think about paying you. And we'll, and we'll circle back, it's gonna be fine, but I'll think about it. No, payment is due upon receipt of the car because the mechanic has already done that work for you. So the problem is a lot of times, especially if you're not used to talking to clients, you know, just at, at any level where it's like, hey, I'm just used to, you know, putting my nose to the grindstone and just doing this work and pumping out all of these projects. I'm not used to having to talk to them one-on-one -on -one, and I'm especially not used to talking to them about payments. This is just one of those things you have to get over. No client ever wants to discuss it with you. And for instance, for me, I never want to discuss it with clients. So for instance, <laughs> sometimes we'll have a horrible hearing and I will tell the client that they should not testify at this hearing. The judge is going to hate them. Everybody in the room is going to hate them. They're not going to get what they want. They shouldn't testify. Here's what's going to happen. If they do, I advise strongly against it. But the client being who the client is says, no, I'm going to do it. I deserve this. I'm absolutely going to do this. Yes. Client testifies. Turns out, unsurprisingly, judge hates the client. And everybody in the room, including the court reporter, hates the client. And the client does not get what the client wants from that hearing. So everybody's a little bit downcast. I'm a little bit angry because I have advised them against this and I've made them sign a piece of paper saying that I advised against it. But at the same time, I know that that client now owes me $2,000 from this hearing today for the work that I've done. And there's never going to be an opportune time unless, for instance, you've really won a really big trial or you've just, you know, got a really good project going. There's never going to be a good time to talk about your payments ever. So the thing about it is you really have to, excuse the family law pun, you have to divorce yourself from the emotions of the project or from your relationship with the client because it really is just business. And so what I do is I make it a point and I'll kind of get into this in a minute, but I make it a point of following up personally when clients have not paid their invoices. So when they're a week overdue, things like that, I make it a point of telling them and me reaching out personally. So it's never a, billings, a billing department, never a collections department, it's me because I want them to know that this is now on my radar and I'm doing work on their case. So they should want to pay me something to think about. And then also use credit cards and online payments to your advantage. So the biggest thing that I see that, have, that has increased revenue for the firms that I've worked for and work with now as part of uh, being with client pay and law pay is adding a link to your signature block. So essentially every link that I send out when, it, when it's attorney Turk time has, has a little link at the bottom that says pay now below my signature line. And that's hyperlinked to my law pay page. So that would be hyperlinked to your client pay page. And it's beautiful. So that there's never a question from a client of how do I pay you or how do, how do I get in touch to pay you? Never a question. They find that link is in every single one of my emails and you can customize that link and pretty much and a lot of processors will do this right but you should be able to customize that link to say what you want so mine always just said pay now a lot of others just say click here to pay things like that but you can do these little tweaks that will help you in the long run from having to go and collect things after the fact so super super easy also adding payment pages to your website super easy, like client pay helps you do that. That's part of like an added included benefit, you know, of being with us. But essentially that's a big thing too, because again, I want to reduce as much friction as possible between my client's pocketbook and my bank account. So that's one of those big, big things, super easy to just add a payment page and add a signature block or add a link to your signature blog. Also, you can send clients links for exact amounts. So I don't know if your clients are the same as my clients, but some of them have what I would call convenient amnesia when you're asking for specific fees. So for instance, mediation's coming up and I need the client to pay $1,000 for a mediation fee, essentially. So it's a fixed amount. I need it to be exactly $1,000 and I need them to pay it. If I just send them a random request 
and I just say, hey, you need to pay this. Half the time the clients will put in, you know, $500 and then they'll call me and be like, well, opposing counsel should have to pay the other 500. Well, you know, the judge ordered us to pay the full thousand. So no, just pay a thousand dollars. But it's like these back and forth phone calls or emails where it's like, no, pay the total amount. So what you can do though, is actually send payment links for exact amounts where they can't change the amount. So if you need just a thousand dollars, I can send what's called a quick bill and send that out it's $1,000, they can't change that field, they can pay it, and then I get notified immediately when it's paid. And especially with quick bills, I can actually see when they've opened the email and when they've paid it. So that makes it very easy, especially when you have clients that are like, oh, I never got your email, which again, for family law, don't know why that happens all the time and why people wanna lie about receiving my emails. It's so crazy. <laughs> but essentially that was an easy tool to have in my arsenal. I would say, no, actually I see this. It was sent to this email address. It was opened at X date. So especially if you have kind of flighty clients that helps you out a lot. And then also you can set up a payment page on your website, which I've already talked about, super powerful tool and makes you look a little clean and a little professional there too. Uh, as something that they can click on and toggle on for your website. You can also, and I'll talk about this on the next page too, set clients up with payment plans, which that's becoming more and more prevalent, especially for me, and especially with the pandemic hitting and people kind of losing their jobs or not knowing what's going on, uh, financially speaking, for their future. So I would set them up with payment, with payment plans. Super easy to do, uh, especially with your payment software, and we'll talk about that in a second. Also, age they are. So age accounts receivable for this one, especially no one to make a deal or when to cut your losses. So I'll talk about this super briefly, but we had an insane amount of receivables for my last firm. Like I think because there were a lot of attorneys, I mean, we probably had around 40 attorneys and easily had probably over a million dollars in age JR, which I hope everybody is cringing on this call because we cringed uh, when we really looked at the numbers. And so what we ended up having to do was figure out, are these accounts that will actually pay us or are these accounts that have gone radio silent? And what we did for the accounts that had gone radio silent that we knew weren't going to pay us, uh, we didn't send them to a collections firm because for Texas, it's very difficult. Texas is a very debtor friendly state. So harder for like us to collect on those fees from that client. Also, we didn't want them slandering us online, which happens a lot when you're going after payments, right? All of a sudden you did, even though you won their case, you did such a bad job because now you're asking for payment. So what we would do instead is we did it one time, kind of a one-time deal, but we made a deal with them. So all these people that had gone radio silent for months, we basically said, hey, if you pay online within the next five business days, we'll only charge you for half of your outstanding balance. So if you owed the firm $10,000, if you pay within the next five days, well, actually only, you only have to pay $5,000. We'll, we'll forgive the other five. All you have to do is click the link below my signature line that said pay now and pay online and then we'll confirm and you'll be good to go. And we got a ridiculous amount of people taking us up on those offers. And we did it right around November. So it was right before the holidays, like, hey, start 2021 off with a clean slate and not owing your attorney anything highly effective. If you're interested in doing that, I have tons of email templates that I used uh, to send out to clients that kind of laid out the facts and laid out the, the deal that we basically were giving them. So feel free to email me jturk at clientpay.com and I can send you those templates that I used. Very, very effective. All right, when it comes to authorization forms. So this, be very, very careful, I would say. So the name of the game is trying to prevent chargebacks. So if you are trying to do a scheduled payment feature or like an installation plan from a client, right? So they're gonna pay you back or they're gonna pay you in monthly installments. Perfect, because I will take money in any way, shape or form that I can get it. So absolutely, like I will take a payment plan, especially if they're not able to pay the full amount of what they owe me. What you need to do is offer them this authorization form. So this is basically the client saying that, yes, I, Jordan, agree to pay this firm $500 for the next X months or until X amount is reached and here I'm signing it, here's my credit card information. So what this does is, is say that client later on got angry and tried to go into contact their uh, bank and say, uh-uh, I'm instituting a chargeback. I didn't agree to pay Jordan $500 a month or I didn't agree to pay this firm $500 a month. 
well, this is super easy at that point to win the chargeback if you can send it to the bank and say, uh, uh no, not only did she agree to do it, but we have her, here's her signature. She signed an authorization form for this. Super easy. These templates are available for free on ClientPay's website under resources, or you can email me again, jturk at clientpay.com and I can send them to you. You do not have to be a client pay customer, but if you are taking credit cards in your firm right now, I highly, highly, highly suggest that you use this credit card authorization form. Even if it's just one-time installments and things like that, it's just nice to have an added layer of paper, just an added layer of CYA for yourself uh, when it comes to your firm. Because, hey, you're going to win the chargeback. That's not a question. You just want it to be a very smooth process when you're doing it. Okay, tips for getting money in the door. So kind of the psychology about payments and how I figured out when I should be sending invoices, things like that. So first of all, be very practical and very organized. So a big part of this is a lot of firms did not have good billing structures already kind of instituted in their firm. So they'd be wait so clients would be waiting like three months to get an invoice from them. And it should be, you know, we did it monthly and that should be without question that they're never going a month without receiving an invoice from us because the longer that a bill sits unpaid or an invoice, you know, waits to go out, the less likely it is that it's going to be paid in the first place. So if you're behind right now, what I would suggest and what kind of we had to do is everybody who bills in the office comes in one Saturday you have it catered, you get some lunch, and basically everybody is forced to put in their hours uh, during that day so that you get caught up in that one day. And then you can go forward billing in your monthly scheme or your two-week scheme, just how you do it, essentially. But that's the biggest thing is just to get caught up to begin with and bill clients regularly, predictably, and as close to payday as possible. So my big thing is I always usually build around the fourth of every month, depending if it was a weekday or not. So if it was a weekday, it hit around the fourth of every month. And why? Why did I want that? Well, if they got paid on the first and then I gave that money a couple days to clear in their account to make sure that it was there, I wanted my invoice to be the first thing that they saw once that money was free and clear in their account. So I wanted to be the first one that they paid that month. So that was kind of my psychology behind why I wanted it to be specifically on the fourth day is that and not say mid month or something like that. I want to make sure that they got money, they got paid and I too would like to be paid. And then the biggest thing that I think a lot of firms and this is universal, that's not just law, that's not just architects, this is everyone. But the biggest thing that I'm seeing is that people aren't following up with clients on unpaid invoices. So what you need to be doing is about a week after you send out that initial invoice, you need to be email, you need to be sitting down, putting it on your calendar, because if it's not on your calendar, it doesn't happen, but you need to be sitting down, putting it on your calendar that you're following up on these unpaid invoices. And then essentially just have a little email template and email every client that hasn't paid. And I like to be the one doing that because it has some gravitas to it. You know, I feel like clients are a little bit more chastised when the main person that's working on their case is emailing them as opposed to the billing department or the accounting department. So just be very cognizant of that, that you need to be doing that. And if, if, it's, if you're running the reports and they're showing, you know, especially for your clients that you're kind of lagging behind or that they're not paying on time, this is an easy thing to do. You'll get money immediately. The amount of clients that I send this out to where it's like, hey, Chad, you haven't paid your invoice. You know, I noticed, you know, you owe X amount. You can pay online by clicking the link below my signature block. Let me know if you have any questions about your bill. The amount of, the amount of, the, what am I trying to say? The amount of people that responded to me and said, oh, I'm sorry, I must have missed the initial email from billing. I just paid it. Please let me know if you need anything else. So all of a sudden I got an extra, you know, seven to $10,000 just doing 15 minutes worth of emailing. And that's solely because I was following up with them. So again, I know you don't want to do it. I know no one wants to talk to clients about money, but this is something super, super easy that you can do that will get money in the door. And then also offer options. So my big thing is pretty much every single one of my clients now wants to be able to do everything remotely. So if I'm taking their initial retainer payments or their consultation payments and things like that, I'm not going to go to the office and hope and pray that they've dropped a check or cash or done something like at my office because we're meeting remotely. So instead, I'm going to offer them online options. So, hey, I'm looking forward to this. Click the link below to pay. You know, I charge X amount for the consultation. Oh, you want to retain me? That's perfect. That's great. You know, and the retainer is going to be $5,000. Here's how you can pay online. 
But again, here's the deal. I will take money any way that I can get it. So if the client would rather wire me money or if the client would rather, you know, drop some mysterious bags by of cash, I will take that all day. But I'm about offering convenience. And when it comes to credit card fees and things like that, I view it as the cost of doing business. I bake it into my fees because to me, I'd rather, again, have my firm run more efficiently and get money in the door faster than not. And then speaking of faster, this is an internal, uh, this is really cool. We ran some like kind of internal audits of law pay and uh, client pay in our systems. And we found that 62% of electronic bills that were sent out got paid within 24 hours, which is kind of crazy, especially if you, if you think about it in the law firm world where a lot of things are sent out paper copies and then you're hoping and praying that somebody within the next week will drop a check by your office. So this is kind of unheard of. And really, really cool to see. And it's only going to increase at this point, especially with the pandemic still going on. So just something to think about when you're really trying to weigh options about online payments and what's going on. All right. And I think at that point, I might be ending a little bit early, but thank you very much. If you have any questions, my email is jturk at clientpay.com or experts at clientpay.com. Happy to answer any and all questions. And then we'll do QA right now. Right, Hillary? Yep, perfect. We do have a few questions in the chat box. Um, and if anyone else has any questions, feel free to type it in there and we will ask Jordan. Um, the first one is, how do I set up ACH payments? Is there a fee involved? And if so, approximately how much? Right. So you can email if you're already with client pay, it should already be included. You can email your account manager about it or experts at client pay. Somebody will answer super, super quick and they'll let you know. I believe for client pay and for us, it's a 1%. Uh, for ACH transactions. So again, but shop around, but that's low. So shop around when you're doing that. Wonderful. How do you refund the balance of an unused retainer? So there should be a link and you can contact support and they can take you through it in about 30 seconds, more so than I can. But essentially you can find that initial, you can find the initial uh, retainer payment and then you can say there should be a link where you can click to refund and how much. And so that's what, because usually a lot of times, I mean, I don't want to say a lot, like usually retainer payments for law firms were not the total cost of the case and they would cost more. But for the few where we actually had to refund it, it doesn't, it takes maybe 30 seconds to do it. And it takes, I think like three days, four days for the client to get it because it has to go back through the banks and make sure that it's all good. Um, I have a question for you. What is the number one takeaway attendees should take from this webinar today? just to make it easier for clients and don't be a stick in the mud about adopting new technology, especially for law firms, the amount of people and attorneys that have told me that they wish they would have done this, you know, five years ago, because it's, especially there, there are way more statistics for us than for y'all. Sadly, there just aren't as many uh, studies done yet for architects, but for attorneys, I mean, there were uh, some staggering numbers where they said, if you are adopting online payments that statistically you were collecting $10,000 more per attorney in your firm, just by virtue of those taking online payments. And correlation doesn't equal causation, I know, but still they have some really cool statistics on that and what's been going on. And that's pretty much going to be across the board for every other kind of professional organization. All right, well, I'm gonna do the wrap up really quick, but if anybody does have any questions while that comes in, we can go back to them. Um, thank you, Jordan, and thank you, Client Pay, so much for partnering on our Monterey Design Conference as a legacy partner and for putting together such a great presentation today. And attendees, if you guys have made it this far, AIA California staff will submit you for AIA Continuing Education Credit, and that should appear on your transcript within the next week or two. AIA California will be hosting more partnered webinars this week and details on our 2021 Monterey Design Conference in MDC University are available on the AIA California website. And thank you again, everyone. And I think that's it. Thank y'all. Perfect, thank you.